beginning with our next event, Amor Italiano with Lorenzo Angeloni, Shobha De, and Owen Juladat shortly. I would like to request Mrs. Maina Bhagat, ma'am, to come up on stage and introduce the panel to us. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to the second day of the APJ Kolkata Literary Festival. I'd just like to say that this is a very, very special event for us. We are honored, delighted to welcome His Excellency Lorenzo Angeloni to Calcutta, both as a diplomat and as a writer. And I think that's a wonderful uh, combination because it goes without saying that when you are an ambassador or you are in the foreign service, your experience of many cultures bring something special to it. So I would say that this is one of our loveliest events ever, and I would like you to give the ambassador and Shobha Day a big hand. And thank you, Shobha, for taking this forward. Uh, I'm so pleased that you're all here today. Today on the panel, we have Lorenzo Angeloni, who is a diplomat and a writer. He has, to his credit, several essays, reports, and novels, which reiterate the themes of war, dialogue between societies, and personal growth. He is currently serving as the ambassador of Italy in India. Shobhade, she has monitored and written extensively on India's socio-cultural political contours for over four decades. Her 20 books include several bestsellers like Starry Nights, Spouse, Superstar India, and now her latest, 70 and To Hell With It. Oindrila Dutt, our moderator, she is an entrepreneur, an anchor, and moderator. She is the executive director of Open Doors, an event management company. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for waiting. This the delay is only because the last session was really gripping. Shobha was part of it, so it just went on a little longer than it was meant to. I think she said something about Shobha being fearless, and that's the quality that I've always associated with her. It's always such a pleasure to be on a panel with her, and wonderful to have you here with us, Lorenzo. He's written a charming book, and we've called this session Amor Italiano. Now, everyone, and I'm sure there are loads of people here who have been to Italy and experienced the charms. I mean, what is there not to love about Italy? You fall, you literally trip over history and heritage at every turn in a city like the Eternal City, Rome. Art and aesthetics unparalleled in a place like Florence the gondolas of Venice, and also the crowds, which we won't talk about right now. The slow, sleepy charm of places like Siena, San Gimignano, of so many places that you dream about. They reek of romance, Tuscany, and obviously you expect love stories, great abiding love stories to come out of a country that promises you all of that. Now, what is really interesting is that this behind my scenes is not the usual love story. It's also largely a breakup and human relationships heartbreak story. And I'm going to start by asking Lorenzo that in the middle of his diplomatic chores and, you know, being all cut and dried in work, dealing with crises. What made you choose love stories as your preferred genre of writing? Well, um, first of all, thank you very much to Maina Bagat for uh, the invitation to join this beautiful vibe here in Kolkata during especially these days. Uh, it's a vibe of different sort because we have four million people <laughs> gathered here close, but the vibe of literature is always uh, a special one. Um, so to, to respond to your question, um, I have to start a little bit back. So uh, saying that uh, I think when anybody starts writing something, is 
like possessed, no? I mean, so there are topics that you are following maybe since your youth, you are not even aware, your interest, in, your interest going more and more in this direction, and uh, after a while when you start expressing, the vein come up. So you discover that this is a topic that you are following since ever. So, and I think this is more or less the story of many writers, no? I mean, I, I read many interviews of writers saying that at the end there are two, three topics for everyone that persist in your mind, even torment you, no? at the point that you have then come up with some stories, idea, or whatsoever. So for me, basically, uh, there were three topics where I was, I was always attracted. The first that has been for a while related to my job is what we can do to tackle war. So not, not I mean, as uh, people on the theater of war, so, but to tackle war in our life. So what we can listen, uh, uh, observing war, and bringing back in the daily life. So one of my novels is devoted to this topic. The second one that has not been expressed yet, but still keep attracting my attention is uh, the, the junction where extreme poverty and extreme richness meet. So what happened to people? when they are confronted in situation where, in all the country now, no, you can have situation where extremely poverty meets extremely uh, richness. And the third one uh, we discuss, uh, the one we discuss today is how a couple works. So uh, I refer to a couple of men and women, but I mean, it, it's the same for any kind of couple, so when love is there. So why uh, we have to go and to experience often this uh, uh, harsh uh, moment of heartbreak. So I was telling last night that I think that most people sooner or later experience this. And what happened afterward? So how do we react after a heartbreak? So there are the usual way out uh, from a heartbreak or Heartbreak means also a possibility to start or to continue a, a personal growth towards a better relation in the future. So these are more or less the reason why I keep observing a part of my personal life. I keep observing how uh, things were going in the couple of friends or other people and trying to understand. And then from this huge reservoir, I carved out a story which is in the book. Okay, Shobha, uh, you know, I must tell you that under that hard-nosed journalist exterior, somebody who's really practical and tough, I'm sure there's an incurable romantic lurking inside Shobha Day. So, Shobha, what are some of the great love stories, writers that have inspired you, and what is it that you are looking for in a love story. Could I just pass that on to her? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank Moina Bhagat and her whole team for inviting all of us. It's such a special festival, 10th year, the edition, and 100 years of Oxford Bookstore next year. So a big round of applause for everybody and the volunteers in particular who've been fantastic. And it's really significant that we are here today when another India is happening. The future of India is happening not even two kilometers away. And uh, this is one India reality, which is our reality, perhaps. And that's the future of India and our future reality. And I like it that a literature festival will be able to, in many ways, embrace both this and that. And that's what good love stories are about, isn't it? And all love stories are essentially war stories. They're stories that involve conflict. Yeah. So uh, on some level or the other, because otherwise it's a tepid love story. There's no tumult, there's no passion, there's nothing. It's just dull and boring and saccharine sweet and it doesn't interest me. So I would say the greatest love story that I have read ever in my life and can keep reading over and over again is War and Peace. Mm -hmm. And the characters in that stay with you forever. Uh, they inspire you, there's a heartbreak, but it's set against such a dramatic backdrop. And that makes it, you know, oh, just dazzling. And of course the writing, there's 
who am I to comment on the writing? It is a classic for all time because it's so wonderful. And for me, yes, I think everybody, uh, however tough and hardened we may pretend to be, uh, there is a romantic self without which what is life? What is love? What is existence if you don't have rom romance alive in you and love within you? So to me, that's uh, something which is like a very primal driving force. And uh, I, I like to think that I feel passionately about life in totality. But definitely, since we are talking about Italy, and he has written a very romantic book, which I have read, and it is about heartbreak and, and moving forward or not, because it ends on a rather ambiguous and wonderful note, like good love stories must. They must never have clear-cut closure, because then your own imagination stops. Because you know the ending. And I like love stories to make you think, OK, what happens if these people meet again? Or uh, which are they likely to? Will they love each other again? Will they recognize each other again? All of that. But our own honeymoon, and I wish my husband would pay a little more attention than to be on his phone. I caught you again. You love your phone more. Or publicly, you have to say you don't. At any rate, our honeymoon was spent in Italy. We went to Venice and Florence, and it was by far the most wonderful way to discover Italy, a romantic way uh, and a passionate way to discover love and love for food and wine and beauty and, and love for each other, of course. But that came, I think, after wine, food, and beauty, if I may say so today. Just joking. It was because you were on your phone. But thank you so much, all of you, for giving us both this chance. Thank you. OK. Uh, Lorenzo, Shobha talked about something very essential in your book. You know, the conflict, the struggle, the fighting, the heartbreak. And uh, it, there are a lot of writers. Uh, so this is really a two-part question in Italy, Umberto Eco, uh, Dante. Elena Ferrante, who everybody's talking about now, Pasolini, Buffolino, uh, Moravia, so many. So who of these have inspired you? And why is it that, to me, this really interesting uh, book that you've written, The Love Story, the love and happiness part of it is just a little part, small part of the book. And most of it deals with the friction, the heartbreak, the problems. I think that every, well, well, maybe not every, but most of um, the, the masterpiece, the, the masterminds in the, uh, in the literature, yeah. sooner or later have chosen to say something about love. So I mean, this is a universal topic. So I mean, uh, uh, attract, uh, I mean, a writer is uh, naturally attracted by love and by the multiple declination of love. Um, of course, all the, uh, the, the Italian writers that you listed are all, I mean, very well known internationally. And uh, of course, they have written, uh, I would say Pasolini also has written very uh, deep and emotional lines on, on, on love. Um, for me, uh, the inspiration was uh, coming from uh, a kind of love that comes from a difficult or tragic situation. So the other way around. Usually, Romeo and Juliet and all the others, so they are all tragic stories, OK? The family is against, or there is something that is hindering uh, the development of this beautiful love. Uh, the, the two are killed, or I mean, a anything tragic you know, in the classic literature of love. Uh, I prefer, I give you an example. So I prefer to see love coming or uh, um, coming up from difficult uh, situation, tragic situation. One of these novels, for instance, is The English Passion by Michael Ondatje. So this is a, a part of the beautiful film, but the, the book is really amazing because this shows this tragic situation of a, uh, a deep wounded man and uh, exhausted noon trying to help, trying to survive. And in this particular tragic situation, uh, 
beautiful love story comes up, no? I mean, it's like a lotus flowers from, from the mud, no? I mean, it's really unbelievable. Or situation where love is unexpected. So, I mean, I read recently um, a novel which is called The Possible Love. It's an Italian uh, author who unfortunately passed uh, recently, is uh, Ceronetti. In this possible love, is a story of a love story between a man of 75 years old and a woman of 30. So that they just meet in the circumstances of the book. But, I mean, th this was really, it seemed to be something impossible, no? And uh, at the end was possible. So this is really the story that attracted me as a reader. And then I like to, I mean, insert no, in, my, uh, in my interest for, for this kind of huge uh, event of love. Of course, uh, as Shoba was saying, so romance is very important in the life of people. So I think that we should change the, we, we don't have this problem in my language, but we, sh we should change the, the, the expression in English to saying instead of falling in love, raising in love, the, which is much more you know, uh, close to the feeling no? that you are when you are in love with, uh, you can be in love with, with your husband, you can be in love with nature, you can be in love with many things, but when you feel really love is something that raises you up. So I mean, that's of course on the personal note, something that is really, Amazing to experience. Yeah. So that's on, on the personal side and okay, super great. Deep. Lorenzo, uh, Shobha, you've read the book. Now, I'm asking this in the context of the fact that today, uh, feminism or women's rights, equality, all that gets so much attention. And one of the biggest friction points here is because she gets her dream job in Kinshasa. And he says, why should I go? I don't want to go. Whereas all these years, for generations, it's always been understood that even if she suffered at her job, if he got a job, she would have to go. So how, does that, is, how much is that contributing to friction and the higher divorce rate, the inability to adjust, the fact that women understand now, believe, rightly, I think, that their careers are as important. Where is that point where you have to adjust the man and woman? Well, uh, Oindrila, I didn't quite read it in the same way. Okay. I didn't read it as something um, negative. I read it as something which is uh, extremely valid in today's context. Uh, it was almost like a feminist statement coming from him and uh, that it is a reality today that we question the choices we make whether in love or not in love. It's happening to a lot of professionals uh, in committed relationships, marriages, uh, where they are uh, made to choose. It's normally, or at least 10 years ago, it was understood that if the husband is transferred, the wife either takes a, a, a step back in her own career and her own dreams yeah. and just follows him. Normally, the, uh, the explanation is for the sake of the children and, you know, boring reasons like schools and uh, domestic issues. Yeah. Yeah. But here is a lady in the book who is ambitious and also passionate about what she's doing. As passionate as he is about her, maybe she's as passionate about him, but uh, at that point, her passion for the next posting and what it implies and means for her, uh, possibly uh, over, overcomes more romantic notions of their future together. But again, since the book is open-ended, I like to think as a romantic person and as a romantic uh, writer myself uh, that the ma it leaves the man questioning a lot of things. It leaves the man questioning whether he has the absolute authority to make those choices in a relationship, whether he should respect her choices equally and not love her less for it, yeah. uh, that it should not be a friction point but a bridge of understanding for the future. That maybe they can negotiate a future together uh, with their rules of their relationship rewritten. And this is happening constantly in today's day and age. And I think it's an extremely important and valid 
dialogue between men and women because more and more women are working uh, than they ever were previously. And these are questions of choice that are going to emerge increasingly. So yes, I, I, I loved the way the book ended and I liked the tension between them and a diff difficult decision in a romantic relationship taken and stuck to by the woman, I think fantastic. Great. How about you, Lorenzo? How does it work out, not just in your book, but in Italy? Tell us about the scenario there, man-woman, uh, uh, man-woman relationship, relationships. How has it panned out? How much of forward thinking is there now? Well, uh, the, the novel uh, was, uh, as I said before, carved out for, from a reservoir of observation that was basically what was happening in my country. I published this book some years ago, first in Italy. So this is the English translation. Uh, in Italy, uh, as in many other European countries, but let's focus on Italy. We have a specific situation in Italy, actually. So in Italy, uh, now, fortunately, women enter quite every work. So, and the percentage of women in, in the, the different work are growing. I give you an example of my career. So till 1968, for women was not possible to become diplomat, simply not possible. So don't ask me why, but it was not possible. Since 68, they started entering the career. It's very rare, just one, maybe every two, three years. When I entered the career in uh, 85, so we were 25, my batch was 25 person, only two were women, 85. Now in these last days, it's last years since let's say 2010 onwards, the percentage of women uh, in the every year batch is between 25 and 32 percent of the group. So you see, no, from no enter, and till 35%, no? So that means that women are there, fortunately, they're entering the career. So um, this pose for, for couple, a, a different, completely different way of approaching daily life. So that was based before on more dominance of the male, no? Because the male, the man was, was working. And of course, this is a complete new balance because we are changing something that was like this for centuries. So this is not something that happened like this. I mean, it's something that every open-minded people wish to go towards, but at the same time, you have to adjust. So, and that's one problem. The second problem we have in Italy, uh, divorce was introduced in our country let's say recently because, uh, I mean, we are a very Catholic country, so the church was quite against of divorce, as you can imagine. So divorce was approved in 70, 1974. And this creates also a new dynamic in the couples. So before, was simply not possible, I mean, to terminate, uh, so yes, so easily. Uh, afterward, men and women, were posed on the same level. So, I mean, it was not only the men. So, I mean, I, we, we had the discussion in India on the triple talak, no? I mean, so it was not only the men in Italy to decide. I mean, women could decide for good reason for the law, I mean, to, to go out from the marriage. So, and these two things, uh, I believe, have created the need for rebalancing the couple. And I think that many men, that's uh, one of the reasons why I chose uh, to put the introspection in the male character of the novel. I think that many men are not yet balanced on this new situation. Of course, uh, I mean, there are many that are already pretty in, but there are a good percentage of people in Italy that is not yet uh, uh, familiar, familiar, ready, ready to, to cope with this uh, even uh, and equal uh, situation uh, in our society. Okay, uh, just as a sidelight, I have to tell you that uh, Italy follows mostly Catholicism, and in the land of the Pope, while it's true, divorce was very difficult. Uh, they do have amongst the lowest growth rates in the world, population-wise. So when they want to, they know what they should or shouldn't be doing. They don't follow the Pope and religion. Another thing that happens in religion, uh, sorry, in uh, 
Italy, we believe, this Lorenzo can tell us about, but I'm going to ask Shobha, is this thing of being a mama's boy, and we should be very familiar with it, especially in Bengal. You know, there's this joke, a lot of you have heard of it, some haven't, I'm sure. Why was, that's right, why was Jesus a Bengali? Lived with his mother till 33, believed his mother was God. I will not say the third one here, yeah, because who knows what might happen to us. There's the future of India happening outside. So, Shobha, how much of this do you see till today? Because really, mothers have such a decisive role to play, both in the lives of girls, daughters, and boys. You know, to not distinguish, to teach them that it is your right to be, you know, treated with equal respect, etc., etc. So let's tackle mama's boys first. Yes. So if uh, Italian men are mama's boys, so are Desi men mama's boys, so are most men mama's boys across cultures across the world, and there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, I'm sure it makes um, a person feel so loved, and if it's a positive kind of yeah. messaging, yeah. I don't really think there's anything so terrible about it. It's one of the cliches about cultures that, oh, it's very easy to say, oh, he's a mama's boy because you don't want to deal with other things. So you, you want to demonize the mother and make a, a controlling figure who is not allowing her son to, to develop in a way that society thinks is healthy, but I don't think that's very accurate anymore. And uh, in any case, the demonizing of the mother is generally in the context of the mother-in-law being playing a role in the marriage and therefore he is yeah. not being a good husband because he's a mama's boy. And I don't think that's uh, fair either, neither yeah. to the boy nor to his mother. mother. Because at the end, end of it all, the mother is thinking in the interests of her son and her daughters, of course, but since we're talking not about mama's girls but mama's boys, uh, today's mother is not that old uh, witch-like figure who is out to destroy her son's marriage. Why would any mother want to destroy her son's marriage? It means she'll be stuck with his responsibility for the rest of her life. She'd rather have another woman assume that responsibility or both of them assume it together. Uh, so, oh, oh, when you're talking about talking equality to our children, of course, that is a given. Mm. Uh, we are living in times which are questioning so many sort of norms laid down for centuries by societies across the world. Those norms today are being challenged because circumstances are different. And if we don't speak equally to our sons and daughters, using the exact yardstick and just make them more, uh, sensitize them better uh, in their own interests to show respect. That is it. I mean, that what we're trying to raise is a generation of people who respect human dignity and decency. It's not so tough. Yeah. So whether we are communicating that to a mama's boy or not, as long as we communicate that, I think we are doing what we are meant to do, is raising better citizens for the future. Absolutely. Okay, Lorenzo. Italy, the land of Lorraine, Lola Brigida. So much that is beautiful, attractive, even lustful. So what inspired you about, it? you know, what inspired you the most? What did you see in Italy that... Yeah, okay. What inspired you the most? in Italy. Uh, wh what do you love most about Italy? What would you want others to see through your eyes about Italy? Well, I was reading an article uh, a few days ago written by an American journalist and she was amazed by the beauty and I mean the many outstanding things you can observe the first time that you visit Italy, but she said something that made me thinking. And she said, you know, the Italians, when they want to say, uh, to express that they agree, no? like Tike in, uh, in Indy, no? I mean, they say bello, no? Uh, they say bello, that means beautiful, good, beautiful, bello, beautiful, no? And 
this is a really uh, a very uh, sharp observation. I don't know how much Italian knows this journalist, but actually it's true. So we use bello, the word bello, to say we agree, bello. So if you tell me tonight we want to go to eat Bengali food in a special, bello, well, why? why not? Okay, so I mean, uh, but bello is the first word that I associate to something that I like it, no? So that is something that is telling how deep is no? the relation with beauty, no? uh, how deep is uh, the fact that we, in Italy, in every corner, um, whenever we were born, uh, I was born in Perugia, I grew up in Rome, so I was pretty lucky, but even if you are born in Treviso and grew up in Palermo, it's the same thing. So, I mean, you have beautiful yeah. places, beautiful corners all over Italy. And uh, the density, as I was telling you before, the density of uh, uh, places uh, which worth a visit. So I think this yeah. is unique in Italy. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. you, you cannot travel for more than 30 kilometers without having a, a suggestion to stop for yeah, some testing some food, then. which is different from Napoli to Florence or admiring a fresco or just a panorama. So, I mean, you, you are constantly under this no, light of uh, beauty and, and the light of the sky, of course, no, that inspires so many, so from Goethe onwards, no, I mean, the, so, I mean, the lights, the, 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 the good luck position on Earth and the story and all the, the great events of uh, the history of culture that took place in Italy. So all that uh, arrives to every human being that happened to be born here, uh, like something that is there, but <laughs> you then realize, if you think it over, you realize that it's really something outstanding. Absolutely. In fact, I think for a lot of us from here, it's actually comforting to see those crowds always passionate about something or the other, always with very strong opinions, always doing what we call adda. That's another thing that you notice in Italy. And the sheer numbers, you know, that's also in a way familiar and reassuring. So Shobha, before I come back for one last question to Lorenzo before we open it up, what is it that you love about Italy? What would you like people to see Italy as through your eyes? First of all, I've fallen in love with the word bello. I'm going to be using it a lot. <laughs> and it's a, it's a bello moment right now. Well, Italy has you under its spell because, yeah. as Lorenzo rightly said, you're surrounded by beauty. It, it is so sensuous. Yeah. Uh, it is at all levels and all points, whether it's the food or the uh, architecture or just the, and the, 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 the everything, the painting, uh, yeah. the light yeah. in Florence, uh, the light in Florence and Tuscany. I mean, you know, you, you're spellbound. Mm -hmm. But then it's easy to fall in love equally, as I'm sure Lorenzo must have with India, because we are sensual, we are complex, we are argumentative like the Italians, we are expressive, we are emotional, we are a little crazy, which is also nice. Uh, we yeah. talk too much, we use our hands a lot. So there are lots of affinities. We love family, it's a very mm. strong bond. Mm. Our entire society is based on relationships, as in Italy. Uh, we have our versions of the mafia, which is also wonderful. Mm. Our politicians are corrupt as well. I mean, there's lots, lots of things that are quite terrific, you know, between our two countries. And you lowered your voice when you used the word lust for some reason. Why? We're all adults here. What's wrong with the word lust? So, you know, lust is something we celebrate in India, in Italy. Uh, and the expression of it in sculptures, as in Italy, yeah. we do too on our temple walls. And, and uh, we don't shy away from representing our gods and goddesses and icons naked in public spaces like most other cultures do. We don't stick fig leaves on our great sculptures. We don't pretend that our gods and goddesses didn't have sex. So, you know, the lust is a great word. It's a beautiful, powerful four-letter word. And we should all accept it with the fullness of our hearts. 
So if you ask me what I liked, which city I liked most in Italy, I would definitely say, if I had to keep going back, it would be Florence. Florence. Definitely Florence. In fact, I joke with my children uh, that I hope to take my grandchildren there for them to see Florence through my eyes because I could become a tourist guide there. I know it that well and my husband and I both love it. Yeah. So Florence for sure. Firenze, I love it. Oh,